appreciate Miss Susan filling in for Miss Sharon while she's recovering from her surgery. You need to pray for Sharon and Brother Pete, Brother Ron, and several that's having some impending surgeries. And we pray that God would touch them and bring healing. If you have your Bibles with me, would you turn with me to Numbers chapter 13? Numbers chapter 13 is going to be a rather lengthy passage, so I will not ask you to stand this month, this morning. Numbers 13. Beginning in verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. If you're keeping notes and reading along with me, if I was you, I would highlight that part because God has given promise. He said, I am giving. Not that I'm going to give or someday give or might give or he says, I am giving. By the way, it's interesting to note the phrase I am is the same phrase he used when he described his name to Moses when he first encountered Moses. Remember, he told Moses, tell the people that the I am is sending you. And so when God says I am, you can write it down said, I'm giving the, to the children of Israel from each tribe of their fathers. You shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Interesting to note, did you notice that? He didn't just pick anybody. Did you notice that God picked the leaders? Look, verse 3 says, So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the commandments of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of of Israel. Now jump over to verse number 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Did you notice that he, he makes an emphasis here? He says, bring back some of the fruit of the land. But when you read the previous text, it kind of leads you to believe that Moses don't know what's there. It's not a contradiction. It's Moses believing that God is and will do as he says. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went out and they spied up the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahim, Shahim, and Talamah. The descendants of Anak were there. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eschol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes they carried between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eschol because the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there, and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. 
The Amalekites dwelled in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quietened the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. Extend your hands with me, if you will, this morning, if you're ready to receive a word from God, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful for this word. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity for you to expound and to teach and to show us your will. And Father, now we extend our hands toward heaven because the word uh, tells us that we are to receive the word with joy and gladness and meekness. The word receive means to extend the hand toward. It means to take the hold of by the hand. And so, Father, we are extending our hands to you, telling you by faith that we receive this word today and that we ask you to implant it in our minds and our hearts, that, Father, that we might experience the will of God the completion, the perfection of Christ in, inside of us. Speak now, Father, and forever change us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm learning the older I get that what God has me to preach is by no accident. I'm learning every day how difficult it is to live in the victory that's provided. Uh, we've been doing a series on living victoriously in Christ. We first learned that Christ has already provided us victory. He gave us victory over sin. He gave us victory over death. He gave us victory over Satan. Nothing else can affect our lives. Our enemies, we looked at them last week, our enemies have been defeated before our faces because of the work of Christ on the cross. This morning, I wasn't even in Sunday school, but when I hear the word confidence, I think of the Apostle Paul when he tells us in Philippians that I am confident in whom I believe. He has confidence in Christ. Christ has provided victory. Yet, please look at Brother Sam a minute. I'm telling you, I'm learning the old-fashioned way that it's hard to live in victory every day. It's easy to say it, isn't it? Let's say it together. I live in victory. Ready? I live in victory. Now, the expression on your face don't show that. <laughs> I just got news for you. And you don't look like you live what you just spoke. Yet the Bible tells us that we have victory in Christ. It's been provided. But you know what? It is hard every day to face life and live in the victory that Christ has provided. And I'm finding that the hard way. It's real easy for us preachers to stand up here and tell you how you're supposed to live but my God always challenges me first. And, and I have to learn sometimes by example, living it, going through stuff. Are y'all all right? And I, I mean, it'd be real easy just to get up here and, and hoop and holler and shout and spit and stomp and do all that stuff and talk about how wonderful God is and how marvelous Christ is and how this is obtainable. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't live it through your life daily, it's just words. It's just words. And I want more than words. I want to be like Paul and say, I am confident in whom I believe. And in order for that to happen, sometimes you've got to go through the fire. Y'all right? I said sometimes. In order for you to understand what God's trying to teach you, you can't just learn it by reading it. You can't just learn it by looking through somebody else's life. Sometimes you have to learn it because God's got to put you through it. You've got to go through difficulties. You've got to go through struggles. You've got to go through stuff so that that confidence can come through personal encounters. Amen. Paul can say, I'm confident all day long, and I can read Paul and say, I'm as confident as Paul, but the truth of the matter is, until I face what Paul faced or more, I'll never understand the scope of his confidence. 
Who do we think we are that God ought to just give us victory without us having to encounter difficulties to enjoy it? Y'all ain't shouting me down. That's, I'm telling you right now, you go through it. In order to experience victory, you got to be in the battle. In football, we got what we call the participators and the shirt wearers. Participators are the ones that are out there that are willing to suffer. They're willing to sacrifice. They put their bodies on the line. They put in all the hard work. And you know what they do? They play in the game. And then you got a group of folks that like to wear the uniform and benefit. Mm. They want to benefit in the game, but they don't have anything involved in it. They don't put in the work. They don't put in the effort. They don't like the sweating. They don't like the hurting. They don't like the difficulties. They just want to experience the victory through somebody else's effort. And I believe that's what we do as Christians. We, Christ has put all the effort forward. He's done everything to provide everything. And all we want to do is sit on the sidelines and wear the shirt of Christianity. Not get in the game of life and be a participant in the game. Oh, you're going to get knocked down in the game. My son's here. He's a football coach. He can tell you what I'm telling you the truth. Everybody, you're going to get bumps and bruises. You're going to get knocked down. Sometimes you're going to run into a, a, an opponent that's a little bigger and stronger than you. But only winners keep pursuing. Only winners can enjoy the victory. At the end of the game, when the whistle blows and you've won, you take great personal involvement in that victory. Y'all all right. Y'all, that's just introduction. I love what God's done. For several weeks, God's been taking me on this journey. I can't wait till next week. Next week, I'm going to talk about victory and deliverance. I'm, that's, mm. I can't wait, but I can't get to next week till I get this week. <laughs> this week, God took me to this passage of, of Scripture. I love the Old Testament. I didn't always, but I love the Old Testament. God took me immediately. I said, God, help me to understand. Listen to what I told God. I, I'm going to be selfish. Look at your neighbor and say, Brother Sam, I'm selfish. <laughs> Some of y'all took great joy in that. <laughs> And I appreciate those of you that didn't do that and say, Brother Sam, I'm selfish. But Brother Sam was selfish. I said, God, I need to learn how to live victorious. What do I need to do? Because I've went through some stuff this week. And I've had to ask my God, God, I need your wisdom. I, I need, I need, I, I don't want to tell folks I'm living in victory. I want to live in victory. And, and I don't, God, I'm struggling right now. How many of you have ever struggled? I, I've struck, I told God, God, I'm struggling. I, I'm not handling this right. I'm not dealing with this right. God, I, I'm, I'm not doing it the way. I know I'm not doing it the way it's pleasing to you. I know that I'm a mess right now. And, and I need you, God. You know what scripture he took me to? He said, it, <laughs> and James, he says, anyone lacks wisdom when he asks of God and he shall give it to him liberally. And I said, God, I need it. Now, I don't know how to do it. I can stand up and act like I know how to do it. I can tell your people that I know how to do it. And the truth of the matter is, God, I'm struggling in an area right now, and I don't know how to do it. So, God, you got to teach me. you got to show me. Well, he took me to the story, and here's what he said. He said, Sam, you need to go back. And, and how many of y'all know I've been trying to teach you some old churchy words that we've dropped in our, in our faith? Here's one. God says, Sam, victory can only come through appropriation. Hmm. Victory can only come through appropriation. I looked that word appropriation up in Webster's Dictionary. Here's what it means. It means particular, proper, assigned, authorized. Here's what the word implies in meaning. That something has been set aside, it has been assigned, and it has been authorized for use. It's been set aside for use. But it takes the act of appropriating, taking which is provided for you, and using it. 
Now, we all understand the word appropriation, right? You understand the government appropriates your taxes. They take your money, take my money, they appropriate it. It's designated, it's assigned, they get it, and then they set a budget up on how to use it. Now, we could talk all day about the way they don't do it right, but we understand the word appropriation. Look at your neighbor and say, I understand. Did you know that the Bible says that victory has been provided? Victory has been assigned. Victory has been set apart for you and I to use in our lives. But it is no good if it's not appropriated. It's been set aside. It's been authorized. You've got permission to use it. You've got permission to get it. You've got permission to live in it. But it takes action on our part. In our passage here, I slowed down and I draw attention to, you, to the fact, did God give them a promise? In verse number three, did, in verse number two, did he not say, I'm giving, the la I'm giving, I am giving to the children of Israel? Did God make provision for the nation of Israel? Did he say, this is yours? Well, hadn't Jesus done that at the cross when he says it in finished? I provided for you not only salvation, I provided deliverance, I provided for you victory over sin, the world, Satan, and death. Everything was taken care of at Calvary. It's been assigned, it's been set aside, it's yours. I've taught you the word receive. We do all that little charismatic stuff because I really do believe God wants us to understand. If you want something, you, it's set aside for you. It's here for you. It's yours for the taking, but you've got to put your hand on it. You've got to receive it. I use the illustration at the home of grace. I've got $100 for anybody that wants it. It's free. And you'd be amazed the reaction I get from people. People, I had a girl at the home grace not long ago tell me, say, well, bring it to me. I say, once again, I got $100 free for anybody that wants it. Well, I want it, bring it to me. Hey, hey, why don't you bring it to me? It's free. And I got to thinking about that. That's the way we look at our salvation. It's free. Now you hear a preacher preach on victory. It's, it's provided. It's, it's set aside for you. It's assigned for you. It's free. Well, bring it to me. Lay it in my lap. Since it's free and, and you're going to provide it, just go ahead and carry it to me. Put it in my billfold. That's the way we view what Christ has done for us. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Now, I can't wait until I preach the epistles. I'm not going to get heavy in debt with this thing because I'm going to preach through the book of epistles and we'll take time. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse number 12. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Therefore, well, you've got to look back at the previous verse to understand what he's talking about. In the previous verse, in verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. He tells us how we ought to think and how we ought to approach daily living, living with the mindset of Christ. If you're with me, say amen. Now, I'm not going to die. You're going to have to come back for the digging part. But he says, Paul sets it up and says, listen, this mind ought to be in you, the same mind that Christ had, the same way Jesus approaches life while he was on earth. He wants you to approach life while you're on earth. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Look at this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is to God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. The word work out there in the Greek text means to build up, to edify. It means to literally labor. Oh, Brother Sam, we're saved by grace. 
Yes, you are. Thank God for the grace of God that he showed us unmerited favor then, and yet that we could not perform the law or live by the law. He came and provided the law giver so that you and I now can have obedience in the law. That's who Jesus is. Paul says you're supposed to work out. How many of y'all like to work out? <laughs> I got you're not sure are you <laughs> and I know what you're thinking well, if I raise my hand then I ought to look fit <laughs> and I don't want to raise my hand because the evidence don't match up with what I just said so I'm not going to do anything <laughs> nobody likes to work out you know why it takes time, focus, determination effort don't feel like walking today. Don't walk. Paul says that we're to work out our salvation. You don't work for salvation. It's free by grace. But bless God, once you get saved, there's lots of labor that needs to be done. I said once you get saved, there's lots of labor that has to be done. You're not changed and conformed by the twinkling of an eye. You're not righteous in the fact that you stop sinning and that you never sin again. No, it is a labor of love with the Spirit of God that transforms you into the image of Christ. I've had to labor this week. I've had to labor to have victory. It didn't just come by thinking it, wishing it, hoping it. It took effort. Y'all all right. Y'all looking at me like the calf at the new gate. I know we got hay and all up here for the VBS tonight. But Sam, I, this is a form of Christianity I don't understand. It's supposed to be simple. It's supposed to be easy. Where in the word you get that nonsense? Matter of fact, you won't prove. I'm going to summarize it. Did you see where Moses told the people, go to the land? Look what he says. See if, there's, see if there's giants over there. See if their cities are fortified. See if it's good or bad. You know what Moses did? Moses went ahead and gave them the foreknowledge that it wasn't going to be no bed of roses. He didn't want to give them the false impression, the false idea that the land of milk and honey, milk and honey wouldn't have obstacles, difficulties, struggles. He went through there and said, you go. You check it out. The land of milk and honey is going to be as God says, but there's going to be some things you're going to see that's going to mess up your mindset. That this walk with God, this relationship with God is all a bed of roses. Everything is nice and packaged and I don't have to worry about any uh, interruptions. I don't have to worry about distractions. I don't have to worry about enemies. I don't have to do anything except enjoy the land of milk and honey. You want to be a shirt wearer. Moses says, no, when you go, you're going to find out you've got to be a participator in the game. Well, you're all right. Now, did the 12 spies go? Did you read along with me? Did you, did you read the story? Did the 12 spies go? This is how you respond to me. That way I know you re, you're in the game. Did the 12 spies go? Does the scripture say they come back and said it is just like God says it was? Did they uh, confirm, listen to this, did they confirm that what God said was true? They brought back the evidence of it, didn't they? By the way, my wife buys grapes all the time. I love grapes. We love grapes in our house. I'm looking forward to the day that she can go to Walmart and buy a cluster of grapes and have to have two men to carry it to the truck. <laughs> Could you imagine how big that cluster is and how many grapes was on? I want to ask the question when I read it. How heavy was it if it took two men? How big was it if it took two men to strap it to a pole? It wasn't a little stick of wood and make it easy for transportation. It must have been heavy enough that they had to have a strapping pole to bear the weight for two men to carry. That's a big, one of them grapes had to be that big, brother. You'd have to have a knife to cut that thing. Quarter it. 
In my sanctified mind, y'all know what that is? That's a God mind. They're as big as a watermelon. You ever seen a watermelon? How would you like a cluster of grapes with a watermelon, the size of a watermelon? Y'all looking at me like, Brother Slam, you making this stuff up. No, the scripture says that they went to the land, they spied it out, they brought back the evidence, the fruit. Did you see that? The fruit of the truth of who God said, what God said, said you bring it back. They bought prime, uh, pomegranates. I don't even know what that is. I can't even hardly say it. <laughs> I know it's some kind of fruit, but I ain't never ate one. If they brought back figs, I've seen them. How many of y'all seen a fig? Brother Sam, just being honest, y'all can laugh. It's okay. I just Where I'm from, we ain't growing them things. <laughs> I ain't seen no pomegranate farm around here. But I have seen fig trees, haven't you? Wonder how big them figs was. Don't say, does it? But in my mind, I imagine God didn't let us down on the fig thing either. Now, they came back and they said, God's word is true. The land truly is fruitful. But then they put a conjunction there, but. Hmm. Look up here just a minute. I'm preaching y'all truth. God has provided for us victory. I showed you last week who your enemies are and what God said he'd done to overcome your enemies. Fruit. It is as God says it is. But many of us use that conjunction. But. But. Brother Sam, I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. I'm disappointed. And, and, and I'm just sorrowful all the time. I'm unhappy, Brother Sam. I can't. Uh, life is just hard. Life is difficult, Brother Sam. I, yeah, God said all those things. Yes, the truth is what God says the truth is. But my enemies, didn't they go automatically? The people there are many. The cities are fortified. Then they went to a little father and said, hey, by the way, you know the tribe that produces giants? They're there. So not only do we have an enemy and not only are they large, they are supersized. Well, if a giant lives in a city, how big is the city the large giant lives in? You're not, it's like that little house. Y'all see that little house? They got that commercial with them people downsized and they living in that house and they, they got the food and they, they're scrunched up. Ain't no giant living in a little house. They're living in a house that's comparable. Their cities are comparable to who they are. Are y'all right? So now all that's the backdrop. Let me give you the first point. I only got two today. Look at your neighbor and say we only got two. Here we go. Number one, you ready? How do we appropriate victory? Point number one, you ready? It's simple. We have to, we must choose victory. You must activate your free will to want what's been provided. That makes sense, doesn't it? Did you notice? Look at verse number. Go back over the numbers. I'm back over numbers. Verse, verse number 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. Let us go up at once. Did he hesitate? Does there appear to be any hesitation in his statement when he quiets the people and he gets all their attention? Now, he's one of the 12 spies. By the way, were the spies leaders? Were they men that were respected by each tribe and was recognized as being leaders, people who believed God and walked with God and fellowship with God? They just didn't pick out anybody within the tribe. They picked out people and recognized them as leaders, people who, who followed God and believed God and worshiped God. Caleb's one of those, and he speaks up and says, Hey, let no hesitation whatsoever. Look what he says. Let us go up at once. 
You know what Caleb is showing us? I, God just brought this. It, it's like it leaped off the page. Here's what God spoke to my heart. Here's what God said. Sam, it's not that you don't know enough of the word. It's not that you don't know enough about Jesus. It's not that you don't know what's been provided for you. Can I be honest with you, Sam Johnson? Sometimes the reason you don't live in victory is because you choose not to. It's just as plain and simple as that. Something happens in your life, some difficulty comes your way, something comes against you that you don't think is right because you think you somebody. Y'all right? You don't think you deserve it. You don't think that you ought to have to deal with it. You think that you're excused from it and you, not, don't, you don't have to go through it because you're a man of God. And God says, you know what, Sam? Sometimes the truth of the matter is you don't have victory because you don't appropriate it with your free will. You choose to waller in self-pity. You choose to waller in anger or depression. You choose. You choose. Look at your neighbor and say, I choose. You choose these things. It's not what I want for you. It's not what my will is. It's not what I died to provide for you. It's not what I want. It's what you choose. Anybody in here ever made bad choices? You know what our problem is, is our stinking free will. Our free will messes us up all the time. And, and we, get, we get emotional, we get hurtful, we get angry, we get all these things. And then we want to blame God. Well, God, why didn't you intervene? He already has at the cross. He already has with the indwelling spirit of God. Has anybody in here ever experienced this? I, I need some help this morning. Y'all don't make me feel like I'm all alone. Has anybody in here ever began to make a decision and the Holy Ghost come to you and say, now, hold on. Let, let, let's take time out to think about what we're going to do and how we're going to respond and how we're going to react. Have you ever had the Spirit just kind of come to you and say, now you're about to face something. Hold on to me. Trust me, I'm going to carry you through this thing. And how many of you, when the Spirit began to do that in your mind and in your soul and in your life, you chose not to listen to Him? And then lo and behold, it's exactly what the Spirit said was going to happen, happen. And now you're in the midst of it. Now you why and just, I throw pity parters. I don't know what you do, but I, Woe is me. I don't deserve this. I, I shouldn't have to go through this. I, I, I throw pity parties. Some people choose to be depressed. Are well, y'all right? Some people choose anger. There's a lot of options of things we can choose, isn't it? Well, hang on, brother. We'll probably find something we didn't know about. <laughs> you know what God showed me about Caleb? Is Caleb never hesitated. He said, let's go. Did, did he say it wasn't what they said? He never said there wasn't no giants. He never said that the cities weren't fortified. He never said it wasn't going to be difficult. You know what Caleb said? It's my free will. It's my life. I'm going to choose to follow God. Let's go. At once, let's start the journey. Hmm. By the way, who's in charge of your journey? Who are you supposed to be following? Who are they supposed to be following? Isn't there a cloud by day and fire by night? They're supposed to be showing them the way? Has anything changed from Jesus in the Old Testament to us? Aren't we supposed to follow the Holy Ghost? Aren't we supposed to follow the guidance and leadership of the Holy Ghost? Well, how many of you know you don't always free willingly do that? Neither do I. If you read chapter 14, which... We'll look at a couple of verses here in a minute. In chapter 14, after all this has come about, look what the Bible says. So all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. 
Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children shall become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Wow. Does that sound like everybody's choosing to live in victory? Is everybody choosing to follow victory? Verse 6 says, But the son of Nun, Joshua, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk. And honey, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. How in the world can two men stand against the whole assembly with such confidence? Look up here. It started with free will. They chose to. They didn't listen to the lies. They didn't listen to the murmuring. They didn't listen to the complaints. They didn't follow along suit with all the other Christians. They chose to be separated. They chose to say, I believe in our God. I believe who our God is, and because of what I believe, I'm going to isolate and separate myself and I'm going to live in victory. Hmm. So it begins with activating your free will. You must choose, must, shouldn't you? Number two, last thing, I might preach here a little bit. Look at your name and say, uh-oh. We have to activate our faith. Hmm. Not only you got to activate your free will, you got to activate your faith. Who it is you believe in? Who are you going to follow? By the way, can I get ahead of myself? Verse 22 of chapter 14, I want you to look what God says. <clears throat> Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test, now these ten times. When I read that, I thought, you know, Lord, I've never thought about that and I've never slowed down to read that. You know what God says? Here's the people. They're murmuring. They're complaining. They want to go back to Egypt. They don't want victory. They want to go back and live in bondage and defeat. That's where they want to go live. That's where they want their life. In constant bondage and defeat. And they've not just said this one or two times. It's been ten times since I brought them victory. They didn't just say it once. It wasn't an accident. They didn't just say it twice in passing. They did it ten times. Look what God says. And have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, no, nor shall any of those who reject me see it. Hmm. But look at this next verse. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me how much? How much is fully? Completely. All the way. No turning back. Listen to what God says. I will bring him into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Now look up this way. I'll make a statement. You already know this. Did God excuse Caleb and Joshua from 40 years of wandering in the desert with the defeated children of Israel. 
They had to go along, didn't they? Had to go along. I always wondered. A good thing I ain't God. <laughs> Y'all right. Here's how I think. Hey, Lord, they want to live in de defeat? Let them elect them with somebody and carry them back to Egypt. Let Joshua and Caleb go on. Give them what they deserve and let them have what they deserve. If I was God, that's what I'd do. How many of y'all be like Brother Sam? Just let them go, God, and let us get on to victory. God didn't do that to Caleb and Joshua. Was he punishing them, Brother Sam? No. You know what he was doing? He was allowing them to go through that so it would prepare the next generation to know what it looks like to live in victory. Even while you are surrounded by murmuring, complaining, whining, disobedient children, you can still have victory. That's good. Some Baptists should shout hallelujah. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. Somebody should have just... Are we surrounded by whining Christians? Murmuring, complaining Christians? We're surrounded by people that choose to live in defeat and rather than victory. Uh, do you know why God allowed Joshua and Caleb to go through that? It's because God knew. Listen to me. Listen to me. God knew their faith would not waver one bit. If nothing else, that 40 years strengthened their faith. And not only did it strengthen their faith, but it strengthened their children's faith. When they'd come in and say, Mom and Daddy, why is God making us wander out in the desert with these heathens? Son, because we believe in God. Son, we're going to follow God. You remember when Joshua got to the River Jordan, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When he made that statement, his kids was on the bank saying, mm-hmm, sure will. Wow, we watched Daddy do it for 40 years. We watched Caleb and his, his tribe do it for 40 years. They wandered in a desert where it was dry. They suffered the pain. They went through the suffering. They went through everything because their faith mandated that they do it in the bad times as well as the good times. Victory don't mean nothing if it comes cheap. Them shirt wearers I was telling y'all about, the only time they get in the game is when the participants build a big enough lead that they put them in and, and, and the lack of fear of losing the game. Y'all all right? Then they get all excited. Woo, I get to get in the game. It's 56 to nothing. And there's only two minutes left in the game. <laughs> so I can't screw this thing up and cause us to be defeated. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? So now, whoa, so when I get out there and play my four or five little old plays, get a little sweat going, I can come back and enjoy the victory. That's what we do in church every Sunday. Mm. We come in as shirt wearers. Y'all all right? Y'all looking at me mean. We come in as shirt wearers. We're watching other people go through the pain and suffering and enduring, and they're just staying in victory, and they're walking in victory. We're watching them, watching them, watching them, and then we want to wait for the last two minutes of life to jump into the game. When there's no fear of losing. That way we can hoop and holler with all those victorious people. Y'all right. Let me just muddle through and wander in the desert of life for 40 years, 50 years in my salvation, and then right before God comes or God's die, or before I die, I'm going to get in the game then. Ain't got nothing to lose because I'm going to go to heaven anyhow. Y'all all right. Do you notice when God spoke of Caleb, he said he has a different spirit in him? Look up here a minute. A spirit that was different. Do you know what he did? He was obedient fully to following Moses and trusting him as the man of God. Wouldn't it be nice of God to speak of us and say he has a, she has a different spirit in her or him? That we're going to fully believe in God? Even when things is going tough. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's difficult. 
I'm finding out firsthand this week. I'm just telling gut-wrenching stuff, heart-wrenching stuff. And, 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 and God just, you know what God did? God drew a line in the sand for me, and he said, Okay, Sam, you've been running your mouth for over 30 years about faith. Let's see which side of the line you're going to stand on. You can appropriate it by free will, choose to, and by your faith, what you really believe. Step across the line. Are y'all all right? Is this my, am I communicating this morning? Is anybody getting anything? Which one are we? Are we more like Joshua and Caleb, or are we more like those whining Israelis? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. God, may God set us free. What are you laughing about? Is there a lot of truth in that? And don't believe, don't think, and don't buy this lie that's being preached and taught in easy beliefism out there in the world today that your God of grace, your God of love would never put you through that. If he didn't allow the nation of Israel to do it, then he's a liar. And it don't matter what Jesus did because it's all a lie anyway. Did God give them what they desired? Ten times they rejected God and ten times they refused to live in victory. Ten times they said, God, we're not going to do it your way. God says, okay, I'm going to give them what they want, but they're not going to enter into the promised land. I'll let them wander out here for 40 years and let them die off and I'll kill them off and they'll never reach the promised land. Why? Because the promised land has been preserved. It is set aside for those that want to live in stinking victory. God don't want defeat up in heaven. There is no defeat in heaven. Yeah, but Brother Sam, I ain't there yet. <laughs> you got a whole lot of appropriating to do just like I do. You all right? So no, Brother Sam, I walk in victory every day. Let me come hang out with you. Can I do that? Because I need to learn how you're doing it. I want to watch you when things happen to see how you're living in your victory. Y'all raise your hand. Let me come follow you. I'm being serious because I don't always do it. I don't always do it. I'm being serious as can be. You living in victory all the time, every time, every day, everything. Go, let me follow you because I need to see you in action. I need to watch you so I can learn something. Because this old preacher is just telling you God's honest truth. I ain't being fake and phony. I don't always live in it. And it's my own fault because I don't appropriate what God has set aside for me. Ain't nobody's fault but my own. Ain't nobody else's. Ain't nobody. It's me. I'm just telling you, I do not appropriate by my free will or by my faith the victory that Christ has provided for me. And I know it. Here's the great thing about our God. Brother Sam, was it, was it just written in sand that all of them had to do that? No. Any of those other leaders could have came and said, you know what, Joshua and Caleb was right. We do need to just follow God. We need to confess our sins, we need to repent of our sins, and we need to just believe God and follow God. Any time in that 40 year, I really believe this, any time in that 40 year period they could have come to Moses and said, Moses, we got this thing wrong, man, we're sorry. God, we, should, we were there with Joshua and Caleb. And we led the people astray. We lied to them. We didn't see them. We need to confess and repent. Let's offer a sacrifice to God for our sin. And you know what our God would have done? He would have pardoned them. He would have forgiven them. And they'd have walked into the promised land victorious but watch this look up here real quick I'm almost done they chose with their own free will to live in unbelief instead of faith and it killed them they didn't experience the victory that was provided they didn't experience it they wandered in dryness they wandered in need 
They wandered and wandered and wandered until they were gone. What a wasteful life. When Jesus Christ has provided for us, I love that word appropriate. He has provided for us. He has secured for us. He has assigned for us victory. It's ours for the taking. You can go get you some any time and every time you need it. But it's going to take you activating your free will. That's what I want. And you activating your faith. That's what I believe. That's simple, isn't it? How hard is it to live? God ain't made this thing complicated, has he? Has he made it unobtainable? Is there any reason? I'm serious. Can we just, is there any reason you sit here today discouraged and depressed? Other than you choose to? You won't believe what God has said for you. I've given you a new spirit, a spirit not of fear. And know what he said? I've given you hope. I've given you strength. I've given you my power, my presence. So if you won't sit there and wallow in depression and discouragement, it's because you won't go to the bank and appropriate what's been provided for you. Mm. God help us. That appropriating a good word. Used to say it in church a lot. Some of you older members know what I'm talking about. Your Sunday school teachers would teach you. we talk about it in church. A preacher would say appropriate, appropriate, appropriate. Now we've taken that word out because we don't want people responsible for their decisions and choices walking with God. Gives us an easy out to blame God instead of taking responsibility for our choices. God help us. Every head bow and eye closed. Miss Susan's going to come and she's going to begin to play. Our staff will be here to encourage you, give you instruction, pray with you. You really don't need us. If you do need us, we're here for you. But really, it's as simple as this. You want to live in victory, you got to exercise your free will. You want to live in victory, Got to activate your faith. The Bible says in Romans, the 15th chapter, anything done, not done by faith is sin. It's sin. Plain and simple. So here's the invitation for you today. You want to live in victory? You want to appropriate it? You're going to have to humble yourself before God and say, God, I'm sorry. Just like me, this past week, man, I've had a whole week of confession of sin. God, I'm sorry for my unbelief. I'm sorry for lack of faith. I'm sorry, God, that I've not appropriated. I'm sorry, God. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You've got to confess. You've got to humble yourself. Say, God, I'm wrong. I've been thinking wrong. I've been living wrong. God, change me. If you're not living in victory, guess what you're living in? The only two places to live. Victory or defeat. Would you humble yourself and come? I'm going to pray, and may you be obedient to God. May you fully be obedient to God. Father, speak to hearts and change lives. Help us to appropriate by faith now victory in Jesus. Somebody may be here today that needs to give their life to Christ in salvation. I pray that you would bring them to the cross. Father, may be a Christian here today, Father, who has been more like the nation of Israel. Whining, murmuring, complaining, instead of believing and appropriating. May you speak and may lives be eternally changed now. In Christ's name we pray. Every head that bowed, eyes closed. 
here's an opportunity for you to come. You can kneel at this altar. You can talk with us. We'll pray with you. But if you want to live in victory, you need to fully follow God. You need to appropriate by faith what he has done for you. Would you come?